Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. And today we have Casey Demchak, who's a top award-winning copywriter. He's been writing persuasive marketing copy since 1995 for a broad range of things, healthcare services, authors, speakers, and coaches. He's written on breast implants, penile implants, spinal implants, and much more. He's the author of The Inside Secrets and also the author of How to Create Powerful Key Message Copy Platform. Casey, thanks for joining me. Great to be here, Jeremy. I'm excited to dive into this and uh, it's going to be very lively, and we'll we'll maybe save some of the the breast and penile copy uh, for later. But uh, I always like to start off with a fun fact, and a fun fact you had a really fun fact, interesting about you is you were in the screenwriting business early on. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, I went to Loyola and Marymount University, uh, in uh, which is one of the big film schools in LA, next to SC and UCLA, and I won their top screenwriting award, the Sam Arkoff Screenwriting Award, two years in a row. Well. And I worked part-time as a story analyst for uh, Anson Williams and Ron Howard when they had a, when they had a company before Imagine Films existed. And uh, I read scripts. And I worked with Anson Williams every day, in, uh, who was Potsy on Happy Days. And while I was pursuing my screenwriting career, and it didn't quite take off the way I wanted it to, which was a bummer. But it was work, crazy, crazy business. But working there uh, for a while, part-time, three-quarter time, was just a blast. I got to do a lot of fun stuff connected with that. Mm-hmm. And you were mentioning a fun fact about uh, Potsy or Anson Williams. Yes, Anson Williams, who was Potsy on Happy Days, most people don't know. His real name is Anson William Heimlich. And his uncle, yep, is the guy who invented the Heimlich Maneuver. Nice. So most people would not connect Potsy Weber with the Heimlich Maneuver, but he was one of the early adapters of the Heimlich Maneuver, because his uncle came up with it. And he's a very, very nice guy and treated me extremely well. And I'll always be grateful for that. So what was Ron Howard like in those days? I got to be around him a handful of times. And when he, I was, think of when he made the film Cocoon in the mid 80s. That's when I was there. And uh, very, very nice guy. Very nice. Very quiet. Very quiet guy. Very humble guy. And, uh, he was nice enough. He had private screenings for Cocoon at 20th Century Fox, and uh, I got to go to one, and uh, there was a lot of people there, and I got to ask him a few questions and and be around him a little bit. And there was a few other times I got to be around him, but he was pretty busy making movies, and Anson Williams was running the television wing of their business, and I worked in development, which meant I read a lot of scripts and got, and, you know, Anson let me sit in on all his meetings and stuff, so that was really Neat. I got to the former script supervisor on Happy Days was at that time the script supervisor on Cheers. Hmm. So every Thursday I got to go over to Paramount Studios and hang out on the set of Cheers when they were doing their final rehearsals. It was awesome. before they, it was before they filmed at night in front of a live studio audience. They'd do their final run through, and that was fun. And a funny little thing there is the final rehearsal was always kind of more very straightforward, sometimes kind of raunchy bar humor. And then they would have to, there would be a sensor there, and in between their final rehearsal, they'd break for dinner, and by the time they came back and filmed it, they'd have to tone some of the jokes down. Right. So when I saw the episode on TV a few weeks later, it wasn't quite as bar humorish. Yes. So actually being able to sit in on their live rehearsals was, was a real treat. Yeah. It was actually, it was Woody Harrelson's first year, which I think was Shelley Long's wow. last year. So Yeah. Yeah. I saw all to, of it. Yeah, yeah, I get to just sit there right by the stage, you know, and it's it's a uh, funny thing there was, you know, remember all the scenes in the bar? Oh, you have the bar, yeah. and then they go into Sam's office? Yes. Okay, well, what they'd have to do is yell, cut, and the wall, if you're looking at the bar from, you know, on the TV screen, on the right side was that wall, that bar had a big hinge in the middle, and they would unhinge it and swing it around and open then open up the wall and they would shoot the scene in Sam's office, shut the wall, swing the back half of the bar around and hinge it back together. That's so it's little, little stuff like that. Yeah. So Casey, I want to talk about the screenwriting days because I'm sure you get a lot of the great storytelling that you use in your copy from some of the training. What kind of screenwriting were you doing? What did you win the award? You know, in? I won, I wrote uh, kind of a, 
an adventure comedy. The second year I won, it was an adventure comedy. It was about a, a, an aspire, a, a kind of up and coming newspaper reporter yeah. who got the power to read minds from an alien who would rather be an earthling. Think Bette Medler as, as the alien. This was back when Bette Medler was in all those hit films. And then the first one I won an award for was um, kind of a romantic comedy, which I was like 20, so I don't know how qualified I was to write. <laughs> Probably more qualified to write a frat house, not so story. But right. Somehow, like and it was. Animal just, House, yeah. Something like that, yeah. And it was judged, the award was judged by Peter, Peter Rayner who was the chief film critic at the LA Times at the wow. time. So I got it two years in a row. So I love comedy. And then I also wrote a bunch of television spec scripts for like Cheers and the Jeffersons. Yeah, yeah. Murphy Brown, The Wonder Years. And, you know, and I, I got Some a Some of the classics. Yeah, I wrote it. I got a screenwriting agent. And then there was like an eight-month-long writer strike. I think it was in 1987. Yeah. Which was not good. My agent got fired. Then it took about another year to get another agent, and uh, that agent got fired. The whole scene is just not so crazy. In the 80s in L.A., it was just crazy. So I really burnt out by the time I was around 30 and yeah. just was, had to get the hell out. I mean, I got shot at. My car got stolen. I mean, Really? Yeah, I yeah, it was a drive-by thing out in front of my... Uh, you say it so nonchalantly, this drive-by thing. What? <laughs> where were you living? Where was this? I was in uh, by the beach in Playa del Rey, and um, it's hard to describe L.A. without without breaking the political correctness rules. But I mean, it was like a war zone, and you have the hood, and you have the nice area, and there's not just a few mm -hmm. blocks sometimes in streets yeah. and streets that separate you from being in a kind of well-to-do area versus an yeah. area where you're going to get shot at. Because, but but sometimes you know they would drive by. I lived on this main artery, Manchester Boulevard, that ran from the beach out through Inglewood, and then there was separated by the 405 freeway. And so sometimes the guys from Inglewood would drive through and, and uh, steal cars. And I mean, that's brutal smart. Stuff. I mean, that's brutal, smart. Brutal, you brutal, go to you go to yeah, where the yeah. nice cars are to steal them. That makes sense. You do. And then they were when I driving by one day while I was out in front of my apartment at about one in the afternoon, put my some mail in the mailbox and. They yelled something not nice at me and as they were driving by, and I saw a guy lean out with a gun, and he fired it, and uh, evidently it didn't hit me. Jeez. But uh, I called the cops, and they just kind of like, well, what do you want us to do, go find him? I'm, yeah. And, they <laughs> said, and I'll never forget this. The cop looked at me, and he said, he said, Casey, go change your underwear and just get on with your day. Wow. You know? And uh, that's kind of thought, you know, I, I think I might start thinking of moving out of here. I, kind of I think that's uh should be the title of your next book. Like go change your underwear and get out with go your day. Go change your underwear yeah. and get out with your day. <laughs> um, that's what he said to me. <laughs> <laughs> that's crazy. So um you know, it seems like you're right at the brink of something there. You mean you're working with Ron Howard and Anson Williams, you're a screenwriter, you're winning these awards. Why do you think it didn't and you're working on all these, you know, obviously famous T V shows, you think if you just sort of stuck it out? Like, I didn't. Why you know, do you I wrote, think it didn't work out? You know, I wrote spec scripts for those shows. I yeah. didn't actually work on those shows. Yeah. You know, I, I think that going into Hollywood is kind of thing. Plus, I hit a couple things. Number one, I thought, oh, I'm 30. I'm old. Because you just kept hearing, if you've hit 30 and you haven't made it as a writer, you need to go sell shoes or something like that. So I had this, this age thing in my head. Yeah. And then also... Um, I think the one thing I would have done differently is when you work at a production company, you work really long hours. So to have really time to write, you should work somewhere else. Yeah. So I made the decision of not working at a production company, but just having kind of a, a job as a waiter or something. So I had more time to write. Mm -hmm. And if I had to do it again, and I, but I was very impatient because I was young. And right, yeah. I won these writing awards. I thought, I'm the guy who's supposed to be writing these big movies. Right. If I had to do it again, I would have stayed working for production companies. Like maybe when uh, stayed with Anson and then maybe tried to get into Imagine Entertainment or something. And I would have said, okay, it may take longer to get your break as a screenwriter, but you can still be a producer or be in the movie business. And I kind of got, I didn't make that. So that's one fork in the road where looking back on it, I would have done it different. And in Hollywood, unless you have parents in that industry, which I didn't or something, it's the kind of thing where if you start off in your early 20s, 
you think when by the time you get to 30 you think if i had to do it again i would do this this and this different yeah on the other hand i had scripts when my second agent got fired i had scripts all over town now if somebody would have made a deal on one of those scripts then i would have been able to say that uh hey i did everything exactly right so there's a fine line between and, and the big thing in screenwriting and TV writing is there's just so much more, so many more qualified writers than there are jobs. Yeah. It's like a game of musical chairs. A lot of competition. Yeah, it's like a game of musical chairs where there's not many chairs, but an awful lot of people wanting to sit in them. Yeah. Whereas copywriting that I do is just the opposite. There's just a lot more work out there than there are really good people to do the work. Mm -hmm. So I kind of had a moment, I was like 29 where... I thought, man, I'm, I, I really want to work as a writer. And uh, God, is it screenwriting or nothing? You know, I, I really don't want to be a journalist. And I came home one day and opened my mailbox and pulled out my junk mail. And I looked at some direct mail postcards that they sent me about whatever it was. I don't know. But I looked at it and I had this little aha moment. And I went, you know, they probably pay people to write this stuff. So maybe I can do this. And this is pre-internet. So I went to Barnes & Noble a couple days later and... Uh, Started looking at books. I didn't even know what the word copywriting was, but I went into the marketing section, saw all these books on copywriting. Yeah. And every other book was written by Bob Bly. Right. So I picked up a couple of Bob Bly books, and now I know Bob Bly, which is yeah. kind of cool. And I was able to tell him that story. And um, I read two of his books over and over and over again. And at the time, I was working at nights as a computer operator. And I went to the guy who owned the company and said, Can I write marketing for your company? And that led to me getting hired at a healthcare company and then the breast implant company in Santa Barbara. And what did you have in mind when you said, I'm gonna let me write marketing for your company? What did you want to do? I started a newsletter program. Mm -hmm. Again, there was no internet at this time, so there was no web pages. And uh, so I wrote a brochure for his company. I wrote a newsletter that I produced every month. I even did the layout, which I can't do layout, but I did it anyway. Wrote some PR articles for placement and trade journals. Um, and I wrote some ads that he didn't use. He didn't because he didn't, it wasn't a business where he did ads, but I wrote them anyway and included them in my portfolio and just put that together and went, started, uh, started hawking my portfolio in the same manner you would your screenplays. And yeah. I got, went to a bunch of companies and just by chance I got hired by a healthcare company in Newport Beach. It could have been a dog food company. Or any, it just happened to be healthcare. That's right. how I fell into that. Yeah. So, Casey, tell me about um, with screenwriting. What do you use from your screenwriting days about telling stories? And because obviously, uh, you know, it's got to follow a script and it's got to be compelling. What do you use from those days of uh, the story to the copy? What did you learn in screenwriting? You know, everything. In fact, I, I teach a lot of young writers now. If you're pursuing a screenwriting career. You should pursue copywriting at the same time because you use the same tools. And, you know, like you've heard of AWAI. Sure. Which is a great, uh, I do work for them. They're a great copywriting coaching company might be an easy way to describe them. They didn't exist when I was doing my thing. I wish they did. So, what you know, the real similarities are, you know, good marketing copy is written in a conversational, authentic tone, which is like the dialogue in, mm -hmm. in a film script. Mm -hmm. Also, in a movie script, the descriptive parts have to be very brief and concise. They can't be very flowery prosy. They have to be just tight and concise, brief, short sentences, very short paragraphs. That's how you write marketing copy. Mm -hmm. um, in a screenplay, you want to move people you know, through plot points. You know, You don't want just this linear thing you want to have some twists and turns and curves. And in a good marketing piece, you know, there's a sequence. You're moving people through a sales sequence, right. you know, like a motivating sequence of some kind. So you have these little plot twists and turns. So it's very, very similar. So it was an easy transition to make. And if I had, you know, back if AWI or there was more training that I knew about available, I would have made the decision of I don't have to give up screenwriting. I can just pursue screenwriting and copywriting and kind of interweave them. Mm -hmm. And um, with AWI, I'm trying to play a role with them where I maybe can help younger writers do that. It just didn't really exist. When you when were it doing it. Yeah, yeah. Which it would have, but it does now. So Yeah, and I want to get into some of your story when you first started with the healthcare business. But um, what's something right now that would give someone a quick win to get results in improving their conversion 
and and copy? You know, if there's one thing you can do to improve your existing marketing materials, it's to write better headlines. Because all a headline is for is to grab somebody's attention and then drive them into the body copy. Mm -hmm. That's the job of a good headline. A lot of people don't realize it's that simple. So consequently, they write crappy headlines because they're trying to either be, they're trying to be too witty and clever and sexy, or they're just making a very general statement of some kind. Mm -hmm. And they don't know simple headline writing techniques that will help just get someone's attention and make them go into the copy. So if that's the one thing, if you don't want to rewrite everything you got in there, but just improve your headlines, it's, right. you know, that's what's going to do it. So what do you have a method that you have to help yourself kind of go through and write compelling headlines? Yeah, there's, there's just a lot of tricks and techniques. Um, you, you know, kind of a few of the basics you want to make like a nice benefit statement of some kind. Like here's a benefit you'll get. And a lot of times you can start that with a verb. You know, enhance your, discover your inner, um, realize your true uh, life purpose and potential. Mm -hmm. You know, that just implies, it's a promise. Okay, if I read the copy below, it's going to tell me how to do that. Mm -hmm. Or the most basic one, how to. Or five easy ways to do X. Mm -hmm. Or five things that reveal so it's implied that okay number one those things are going to be revealed in the body copy body copy and by saying you know five easy ways it's also the material is going to be divided into five easy to follow chunks yeah. now those type of headlines aren't zippy witty clever but they get attention you know how to earn how to double your sales leads in two weeks or something you know you have to be factual with what you write right but but if you think a lot of people rack their brains trying to come up with something clever where something very simple and straightforward will usually do the job better. Mm -hmm. Cause there's been so many headlines where, okay, that's funny or, or it's in, or it's a funny play on words, but it doesn't necessarily make you want to read the copy. Mm -hmm. So what were you learning Casey before that first writing position? What was groundbreaking to you that you got out of Bob Bly's books? You know, I realized right away from reading his stuff that you could make a living at working at home as a copywriter. So even though I ended up working for a couple companies, my goal was always to work at home as a copywriter, mm -hmm. just like I had wanted to work home as a screenwriter. And then I learned about flat rates. You charge flat rates as a copywriter. You don't charge by the hour. So I got that. I went, oh, okay, so if you do a $400 job in the morning – in a $400 job in the afternoon, you can make $800 in a day as a copywriter. Now, obviously, it's just not that easy because you've got other stuff, marketing and administrative work and things like that. But it just said to me, what I learned from those books was, you can make, you know, there are methodologies and formulas and things you can learn that will help you become a, a copywriter. And yes, you yeah. can work at home and make a living at it. Yeah. So tell so me, can, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, so you can take cat naps when you want. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So tell me about the early days when you were working at the healthcare company. The first job was in Newport Beach. It was a managed care healthcare company, and which uh, managed care is kind of a funky thing. It's usually kind of an insurance. A company has insurance. They have a managed care overlay, and basically, they're programs that do things like you go in for a procedure. Let's get the guy out of the hospital in a day and a half instead of three days. You yes. know, and it's to save the company money. So yes. it was, uh, it's called managed care, but kind of the. Uh, it's kind of like HMO. Is it kind of like HMO? It's similar, but different. You know, it was called managed care, but a lot of times it's also called denial of care. <laughs> you know, it was, it was, you know, a managed care company would overlay their programs on an insurance plan for a company and they would help manage the health care within that company. Mm -hmm. Like, so, you know, if an employee goes into the hospital, you know, the insurance covers things, but then through the managed care company, they may have a panel of doctors who decide, you know, they only need X, Y, and Z done and then get them home as opposed to they need five things and then get them mm -hmm. home. So it's always like really streamlining the health care so the company didn't have to pay as much. So what do they need you for? What do they need a writer or a I marketer? wrote business proposals and marketing. So so if, if, if you had a company and you wanted to have a managed care plan, you would send out a request for proposal to four or five managed care companies. 
So those proposals would come to my desk and I would have to, and you would have a list of like 27 questions. I would draw from a database of answers and customize answers to your questions. Hmm. Okay. And then I wrote a lot of newsletter articles and a little bit of marketing, you know, so a lot of stuff like that. And I worked in a cubicle that I was like on the 15th floor in uh, Newport Beach in this office building. And I just this gorgeous view of the ocean and this country club golf course right below. So I just sat there. I just, best view I've ever had in my life. But it wasn't a great job. It was yeah. a good starting copywriting job. And yeah. uh, but I missed that view. I wish I had it here. What did I you could, learn from that, that position? You know, that managed care is more denial of care. Than, <laughs> but to know, I, I, I kind of got, you know, I, I built up experience as a copywriter to where I knew I wanted to, I wanted to get to where I could write more lead generation marketing, more sales letters and all that. And I wasn't doing that in that particular job. Yeah. I got yeah. to do a little bit of that enough to where I could pile up a stack of, you know, 10 or 12 good writing samples. Yeah. So I just kind of like, okay, plot my next move. And then one day uh, I went to the, there's this famous mall in Newport Beach outdoor mall called Fashion Island. And so the building I worked in was right across the street. So we'd always go over there at lunch and you'd walk around a beautiful outdoor mall. And I went into Bards and Noble one day. And back then, if you were in marketing, you read Adweek magazine. Again, this is pre-internet. So you, you, I got a hold of Adweek magazine. I was in Barnes and Noble. And in the back, they always had job ads. Hmm. So one day, just by chance, I went to the back and it was an ad for senior copywriter at Mentor Corporation in Santa Barbara which I grew up about an hour north of Santa Barbara. So that was my old stomping grounds. And it was mentor, which, and it said, you know, where they, they had a plastic surgery division, urology and ophthalmology. They had an opening for senior copywriter. So I had the magazine in my hand and I looked to my left, looked to my right, and then I coughed and tore the page out of the magazine right. and applied for the job. And I got the job two weeks later and wow. moved to Santa Barbara. Yeah. So what was that like? Well, that was cool because... When I got there, they, they, you know, I had my cubicle and they had these three marketing divisions. And the first day in the job, um, my boss said to me, okay, you're the first copywriter we've ever hired. We have in-house designers and everything. But the deal is all the product managers in, with, in the different divisions, they have the option of using you as a writer or they can continue to use outside writers. But it took me like 10 seconds to realize, okay, well, if they don't use me, I'm not going to have this job very long. Right. You know, and I grew up in a business. My dad had an automotive accessories distribution business. So I grew up around an entrepreneurial uh, mindset. Yeah. So, and I knew eventually I wanted to start my own freelance copywriting business. So I thought, okay, even though I'm in this company on a salary in this cubicle, I've got to go around the building to all the marketing people in the different divisions and I have to get clients. Yeah. And build relationships. So really that was when my business started. Even though I had this salary, I had to go get business or lose my job. Yeah. So yeah. that was a riot of a job, really. I had an apartment right across the street. I had a half a mile walk in beautiful Santa Barbara from from uh, work to my apartment. And uh, eventually what happened after five years was... By then, they got rid of one of the marketing divisions. So it was just plastic surgery and neurology. But I went around to all the marketing people. And, and what happened is people left the company. They would get new jobs at different companies. And then they would call me mm -hmm. and say, could you write for our company on nights and weekends? Yeah. So I started developing this little clientele. And then I went around to the marketing people where I worked and said, hey, if I quit and set up shop across the street, would you use me as freelance? And they said, yeah. That'd be easier way to work with you, actually, you know. So I quit, set up shop across the street, and even my boss, they didn't replace me. So the product people and then my boss, who was the marketing communications manager, they just started calling me over for meetings. And I continued, you know, I'd go in there for a meeting and then go across the street to my apartment, take a cat nap, and then do their their projects yeah and so yeah. that i and then uh but santa barbara was very very expensive and limited and back then you really didn't have online marketing yet so pretty much as a copywriter you built your business up by getting local business you know so i had some friends who had moved to denver actually my, when i was when i was the, the senior copywriter i had a junior copywriter and we started 
having a, a thing. And she became my girlfriend and we ended up living together. And then when we broke up, we remained awesome friends as we are till today. And she moved to Denver. That's where her family was. And she said, you know, dude, you ought to come check out Denver. I think you'd like it. It's the ruralness of Santa Barbara. But the city activities it, um, like Los Angeles with a much lower chance of being shot, you know. So <laughs> I That appealed I, to you? Yeah, I did. And, you know, I, I visited Denver, immediately loved it. And one of the product people I used to work with at Mentor had just by chance moved to Denver, got a job at a medical device company here. And out here, you know, everybody has basements in their house and they're built out, you know. So her basement was basically like an apartment. So and I didn't have a wife or kids or nothing. So she said, you know, you can rent it out for three fifty a month and see how you like Denver. So I, I did that, and I that's how I started my business here in Denver. I lived there two years and then bought this place. Nice. So just, what kind like, of oh. stuff were you doing that uh, were you writing at the medical company? And then when you started getting outside work, what were some of the the uh, successful campaigns that were working? You know, I did a lot of. Um, Lead generation stuff for like liposuction, penile implants, mm. um, a lot of breast implants, stuff like that. So we, we did campaigns geared towards surgeons and doctors and, mm -hmm. you know, some worked and some didn't. And what I always found was research was huge and I'm not a re – people give me research but – we, we did some stuff like for penile implants. It was a dud. We won awards for it. I actually won an award for the copywriting, but it didn't produce anything. Tell me so, about it, yeah. Yeah, no, it was, it was um, I came up with a really good headline for that one. It was, well, the designer showed me a picture of a doctor with a magnifying glass up to his eye, now, his eye was really big. And at the time, not a lot of urologists were doing penile implants. Because a lot of people think every surgeons learn everything new, and they don't. If they're in their comfort zone and they're making good money, they don't necessarily learn the newest, latest stuff. Right. So when their patients yeah. come in, they don't tell them about the newest, latest stuff because they don't do it, which is kind of sketchy, but that's yeah. the way it works. So we're trying to build up awareness to get, get more doctors interested in doing penile implant surgeries. So... I had a headline along the lines of, I looked at the picture of, you know, the, the doctor looking through a magnifying glass and his eye looked really big. And it was something like, if you're not making penile implant parts part of your practice, you're not seeing the whole picture. Something like that. Mm -hmm. That's the headline. And it was creative, but it also made a good benefit statement. So it wasn't just creative. And I don't remember all the body copy, but um, it won an award, but nobody responded to the ad campaign. Why do you think? And well, the reason why is because of what I said earlier. We discovered that um, the doctors don't necessarily want to learn new technology. If they, they're human. If they're in a comfort zone and they're making good money, you know, they don't want to learn it. So, to, you know, that's what we learned from that is that these guys don't want to learn this mm -hmm. at the time. It's since become more popular. It took time to get some uh, traction. We did a similar thing with liposuction. Um, at the time, you had traditional liposuction, which is basically like putting a vacuum cleaner hose in somebody and sucking out the fat. Ugh. Well, you rip out – it's kind of brutal and there's a lot of bruising and stuff. It's traumatic to the body. Yeah. So we had the first ultrasonic-assisted lipoplasty machine, which is like a little cannula goes into the body and it puts in an ultrasonic pulse out, which liquefies the it breaks fat. it up a little bit. Yeah, it liquefies it so then you can aspirate it out and it allows the surgeon to be much more artistic with the body and, and really do hmm. a lot of contouring. Interesting. So it was like a much better technology. But again, a lot of doctors were well, I'm used to doing liposuction the old school way. I've got this old school liposuction machine. I make good money. Why should I learn the new stuff? So that was one where we found out, again, the obstacle – we had the best technology, but the obstacle was getting them to want to change. Yeah, adapt, yeah, adopt it. Yeah, and then one I worked on that went really well was as a freelancer for a company called Gambro. I worked through an ad agency on this one, and it was um, geared towards nephrologists, who are people who deal with um, renal disease and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, kidneys. Get, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so what they gave me in the research was that the nephrologists were really turned on by stats and numbers. 
You know, they weren't really care about feature benefits of a device. It was what's the bottom line. So we came up with a campaign, a direct mail campaign that centered around statistics. Every headline had a number, like 24, the percentage of blah, 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 that 13, you know, the number of doctors. Everything started with a number followed by, so I worked, crafted the headlines around numbers mm. and it went really, really well. And the reason was because of the extensive research that was done because the medical device industry is, is it's a big industry, but it's very segmented. Very niche. It's, yeah, the slivers. And different things appeal to different doctors, like plastic surgeons think of themselves as very artistic, you know. Uh, urologists are predominantly men. You can kind of yuck it up with them, you know. Ophthalmologists, you know, it's the eyeball, so that's one thing. And then, um, you know, like I said, the nephrologists are very much into numbers. So how did they know that? How did they know that the nephrologists were into numbers? They just did, they did uh, through a lot of surveys and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Have I frozen up? Yeah, you froze for a second. Casey, tell yeah, me. Yeah, I just got a message. It said there's a problem with the internet connection. Oh, maybe that was it. Um, so tell me about some of the headlines with the liposuction uh, that worked and didn't work and the penile implants that worked and didn't work. <laughs> you know, those campaigns were a long time ago. Yeah. I don't remember all the headlines. But, uh... Did some of them, because you said initially it was hard for the doctors to adopt the the new technology with the liposuction and was there a time when you were able to kind of switch it and have them, you know, have it actually responding? You know, really in the medical device, some extent, yes, some extent, no. And, and, and what really get, gets people over the hump is you have a sales force going into the surgeons every single day. Mm -hmm. And ultimately that, that sir, that sales guy has to go in there on foot face to face and really convince them, you know. So what happens once you do an initial launch is your ads become awareness ads, you know. And it, 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 you want to get that initial response, but then once once the cat's out of the bag, you want to just keep reminding them of it, mm -hmm. you know. And you get into, you just keep searching for things. Like with body contouring, it's less bruising and everything. It's faster recovery. You get better results, which means happier patients. Happier patients tell their friends. Plastic surgery is a lot about word of mouth. Because a lot of people get procedures done, but they don't want to tell anybody. Mm -hmm. They talk amongst themselves, you know, like, hey, who did your butt, you know, or who did your breast or whatever. And, <laughs> and that's how it happens. Right. So, yeah. so, you know, that's the thing we kept pushing, okay. They don't want to learn the new technology, but if you do, here's the benefits of it. So you right. just keep right. digging, and then a, a big thing to do in, in this, you know, this is business to business copywriting. Try to talk to the sales guys in the field because they're in there in the trenches talking to the doctors. Because you know what I always want to find out are what are the potential objections yeah. to the product. What you know, so when you're talking to the doctors, what are they? What's their resistance point? Yeah. You know, let's keep developing messaging that's gonna overcome those objections yeah. so it's a lot of work what were some of the interesting objections that you found by talking to sales get people that you wouldn't have known otherwise you know just real basic like hey i'm making four hundred thousand dollars a year as a plastic surgeon doing it the way i'm doing it i don't feel like learning the new thing mm -hmm. I, I got a country club thing i play golf every friday yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and i'm not going to tell the patients about the new kind of lipoplasty and i'm getting plenty of referrals it's just ba that basic human nature, you know. Yeah. You you always have doctors who they want to be on the cutting edge and continuing educate, but a lot of them get fat and happy, and yeah. and it's not, or you know, or they'll say, you know, I'm I'm going to retire in ten years, or I'm in a great position to sell my practice in three years. Why should I bust my butt? Let the next yeah. guy, the next, let the young guys worry about that. So yeah. you, a lot of just it, it, it's really not deep, heavy stuff. It's just basic yeah. human nature, you know. Yeah, you learn that it's going to be more of an uphill battle if you uh, keep at that. So what about um, you said breast implants? What were some of the good the copy that worked with breast implants? You know, really, you know, the thing about breast implants, it's easy to get a smirk on your face when you talk about it, but. 
Breast implants, the, the, if you had to paint a picture of the average woman who gets breast implants, it's not a model, it's not a dancer, it's a mom who's breastfed a couple kids right. and wants to get back the shape that they used to have because after breastfeeding, the breasts lo- can lose their shape right. and everything. So you have women who the, the simple thing is, is, I don't feel whole and complete like I used to. Hmm. And I want to get back what I used to have. And really, when you boil it down, as much as you can talk about breast implants and all that, um, that's really what it's about. So really, that was the main driver behind um, marketing directed towards patients or you know, stuff directed towards consumers. Because, yeah. you know, you always had stuff you direct towards the doctors, but then you'd also have stuff you direct towards the consumers. So a company that marketed to doctors also wanted to go over their head to consumers so consumers would go into the plastic surgeon's office and make a request you know so or or you just had women who their breasts were out of balance and they were self-conscious about it so you you get down to really it was about how a woman felt not how they looked when they mm-hmm. looked a certain way that they liked they felt better yeah so really you had to understand that that's what it came down to not oh i'm bigger or have this perfect shape but I feel better because in most cases I feel like I look like I used to look before I had kids that's Mm. like the number one thing yeah and then we had breast reconstruction obviously you're talking about women who've had mastectomies after cancer or during cancer you know that's just a whole another whole another issue there yeah I mean you're a young guy at the time how would you even know that that would people were thinking that you know, I yeah, I was like in my early 30s when I did that. But, you know, really just you talk to people. And again, research. You know, I wrote a lot of patient education guides too. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I wrote patient education guides that were translated in different languages and distributed all over the world. So, the, we, so these women are getting these education guides about breast augmentation, not knowing that this single 32-year-old guy was... <laughs> Sitting in his cubicle in Santa Barbara, like they feel like you know them, you know. Yeah, and you, you and then and then like a company like Mentor, when they're developing products, they just don't develop them and then tell the surgeons, "Hey, we have a new product." They bring surgeons in for panel discussions. This is what you know, and doctors will talk about this is what we're looking for in the next generation of breast implants. Mm-hmm. And so that's just this was a great opportunity to sit there at a table with plastic surgeons saying, "Why do women get breast implants?" My first thought being, well, they just want to be have bigger breasts, you know, or they, all the stereotypical things you think, and you find out from talking to them. Um, no, that's not why. And then also, you're talking to sales reps, and you're talking to product managers, and you know, you're looking at before and after photos and things like that. And so you just you just quickly dig into it mm-hmm. and learn that okay, there's more to this than, you know, really for all the little fun stories and stuff. It really boils down to you know, people want to age more gracefully. Mm-hmm. They, they want to feel healthy, whole, and complete. Yeah. And, and really, that's what it, what it boils down to. So there's a lot of sensitivity there yeah. that you have to be aware of. And when, once you get that, you're able to write better material. Yeah. So Casey, what else should men know about the psychology of women that we don't know? <laughs> you know, it was the funny thing was is with the breast implants is that you know, we would look at these before and after photos because the doctors always do before and after photos. And as the guys, we'd sit around and go, well, she looked fine before. Yeah. She didn't need to do the after. So what I learned is that, you know, women were more, I think, doing it, I don't know, for other women or they were just self-conscious. But it was like they didn't need uh, – because there's potential complications and stuff from getting breast implants and mm. – and a woman's breast can go numb. Right. They can lose sensation in their nipples. I mean, there's just a lot of things that it isn't all glamorous. Yeah. You know too much about the, the breasts, I think. I do. They can harden. They get capsule. Like when you used to get a splinter in your finger as a kid and it, you'd get that hard capsule. That can, That's a body's natural reaction to putting something in the body. Yeah. So that that's, a, that's something that doctors and, and patients really have to watch out for with breast implants or yeah. any kind of medical device that goes in the body so it's yeah. yeah it's it's so what are some of the most successful campaigns 
that you could talk about and why they were effective? Well, again, I, you know, the, the one with the nephrologist was real successful. And I think of all the ones <clears throat> in the medical area, I've done a whole lot of author, speaker, coach stuff too with books. Yeah. And, tell, um, tell, talk about some of those. You know, with the author, I, it, it really what, what helps with in the author, speaker, coach, with people who have books, anybody out there who have a book, the most successful campaigns, I can look at a lot of, ca- I have ca- a lot of campaigns I work on a lot of bestseller campaigns, so I've written a, a marketing for a lot of books that became Amazon bestsellers. I've worked on campaigns where I wrote equally good copy that they weren't bestsellers. And in the author, speaker, coach world with authors, it's about the author's participation is huge. You have to have really good marketing copy, but the authors who lay back and go, well, I'm a writer and someone else does the marketing. Those don't go as well. It's when the author's very actively involved with Mm -hmm. the campaign, you get much better results. Mm -hmm. So there's, you know, whether it's medical device or the author, speaker, coach world, there's a lot of different variables that determine success, you know, and it's kind of like, you know, as a copywriter, when, when you, when things go real well, it's almost like a quarterback in football. They get too much credit when you win and they get too much, uh, Blame yeah. too much when you lose. It's it's a team thing. There's a lot of variables involved. Research is huge, especially in in the B two B copywriting. You know, and then in in the author speaker coach world, what, the big determining factor is if you've got a book, you want to have a lot of partners on launch day. A lot of people that you know who are e blasting their list about your book. You're offering free gifts along with the book. You know, it takes a real team effort to, to really spread the word. And then having really good enticing marketing marketing copy it definitely is important. But that alone is not going to sell a lot of books. It's it's just a real... Um, it's all, all of it together that works. Yeah, and with social media, it makes it easier these days. You know, that people have to tap into so, social media and, and, and network, other people's networks. Do you find that, you know, because you're writing the copy and you know this about the launch, do you become sort of like their launch coach too? It sounds like, are you instructing them on what things they should do to make it successful beyond the copy? Yeah, well, when I, I, I like to have strategic partners in the author, speaker, coach world. So I'll support companies that oversee the launch and they really do a lot of the nuts and bolts work. Mm-hmm. But when I'm writing the marketing copy, I get the author on the phone. And I can always tell if it's an author who's going to really be involved. Or an author who just wants to lay back and play writer, mm-hmm. and I'll tell them, you know what, you know what's going to really help your can You gotta, you gotta, you know, Wayne Dyer sold books out of his trunk of his car. You know, I mean, this is pre-internet. These guys went around town to town, literally, right, going into bookstores. You know, I mean, it was re- they people don't understand how successful authors really got successful by, you know, kind of their own grassroots selling. Yeah, selling. You have to be a salesperson. So I always tell authors. Nobody is going to market your book for you like you will. No one's going to care about it as much. No one's going to be as passionate about it as much. So you have to come out of your shell. If, if you're kind of on a play artist thing, you don't do marketing. Marketing's beneath you. You need to get over yourself mm-hmm. and get to it because you're the, you're the spearhead of the whole thing. And if you're not the most active participant in the marketing of your book, you know, wake the hell up. You know, yeah. you, you need to be. So what's one of your the favorite ones that you worked on for the author, speaker, coach? You know, I do a lot of uh, kind of spiritual self-help books. I'd say like 85% of the books really are, are in that genre. Yeah. So I did one recently. And what's awesome is about these books is a lot of them say very similar things. You know, I mean, that, that kind of, you know... Uh, Creating your own destiny and setting your intentions, positive thought. You know, that's a big part of my life. So a lot of these books are about that. I kind of attracted this whole niche into my life, which is pretty cool. But everybody comes from a different angle. You know, for example, we did a bestseller campaign a couple months ago. It was this guy from New Jersey, Jay Isp. I'm going to promote his book. It's called 10 Stacks to Success. But he's very edgy. Very edgy guy. I mean, he was like a Jersey street kid who got into a lot of trouble. And then he overcame it and he wants to let other people know how. So his book is very salty in its language and edgy. But so it appeals to a certain crowd. Whereas I wrote another one recently for uh, an author. I'll plug her, Alina Chapman. She has a book called 
you can't escape from a prison if you don't know you're in one. Okay. So hers is like very similar, you know, how to realize your purpose in life and, and become the best person you could be. But her angle is more, you know, if you're in this life of drudgery with the job and maybe a marriage you don't like or something, you know, you don't realize you're in your own personal prison. Yeah. And here's tools you can use to get out of it. So a lot of, you know, great message, people really trying to make an impact on the world and help yeah. other people. So I really love that. And, uh, but it's interesting to me, everybody comes from, it, uh, the books have a different theme. I did one for um, a gal, I can't remember her name off the top of my head, but it was a very self-help motivational book. But she's a professional poker player. Really? So everything was kind of had poker analogies and, com you know, competitive name. So they all have these different, themes or and they and those people are are going to attract their own crowd yeah so i really love working on those campaigns it's so what did each of them want you to do or what did you have to do for them what i write is um primarily are either you know the web pages for their book for, for you know they they have a, a website dedicated to the book so i'll write the home page and about the author page testimonials and then i have a sales page for the book for bestseller campaigns, I write a lot of landing pages. It's the page where this is where we persuade you to buy the book. We want you to get your credit card out and order the book. So you have to take people through a buying sequence. Yeah. You know, those longer sales pages that you see yeah. get you to buy things. So that's where I, you know, 80% of what I write in the author, speaker, coach world are those sales landing yeah. pages. Because a lot of writers shy away from writing that. That's not easy to do. No, but it's fun, and, and uh, once you you learn uh, sequences, you learn formulas about how, you know how to motivate, bring people through a buying process. So, what and are some things that work in the landing page? One of the things that work, you, you want to be very conversational with the copy. You want to be very authentic and engaging. Sales copy used to be more of a one-way monologue from a company or an author. Especially in nonfiction how-to books, I do. You know, they used to be more of a one-way monologue, like I'm the expert, blah blah blah. Now, you know, sales writing has to be more of a more engagement, more of a two-way monologue, mm -hmm. because if an author or a company is writing sales copy, you know, they also have a Facebook page or something, so people can interact with you. They can they can become your Twitter follower, you know, come to your Facebook page. So you have to be much more real and authentic. So what really helps on landing pages for authors these days is you don't just fo you don't a couple of things you don't focus as much on what the book is about you focus on what people are going to get out of reading the book mm -hmm. okay then you also want to have a part where the author is speaking about why they're a good expert and, and so you just can't say I took this course know this but you have to say you know what. I went through some real crap in my life. These are the. This is kind of my low point that I had. Here's what I did to come overcome these things, and mm -hmm. and, and, and 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 you know, go from having a job I hate to working at home doing something I love, you know. But I here was my low point, and this is how I overcame it. And um, you can do the same thing. So it has to be more authentic and real and engaging and and uh, personal. Yeah. And less, you know, talking down at people, but more, hey, I'm right there with you. I've been through the same crap you're going through. I got out of it and I want to help you get through it. Yeah. You know, and that's that's kind of what you have to really blend in with the copy. And you want to have a lot of social proof, testimonials, quotes, um, statistics, graphs, you know, things, you know, if it's a financial book or something like that. So yeah. A lot of social proof, you know, you want a good section on why the person is like an authority, you know, what their qualifications are, but put it in real world terms. Be very lively and conversational and authentic. What are some common mistakes you see people making or leaving out? Well, what I see all the time is a few basic things. They have crappy headlines. I've talked about headlines. But they also, you need to make your copy what I call at a glance friendly. Mm-hmm. So you want to have a liberal use of headlines, subheads, paragraphs that are two to three lines, period, and then some action-oriented bullet points that are benefit statements and very sharp, concise bullet mm -hmm. points. A couple, three more lines of copy, more headlines, 
benefit-driven headlines and subheads. So when people just look at the copy, it has to be quick and easy to read. A lot of people, they, uh, they, they write chunky block paragraphs. It's intimidating. They, you look at them, you go, I don't want to read that. Yeah. Plus, they write, they might be six or seven line long in a Word document. Now you put it on a web page, it squeezes the copy, and it goes from six or seven lines to nine lines. And you just look at the page, they got a crappy headline, and then block, block, yeah. block. You don't want to read it. It can be great copy, but it just looks unappealing to read. Yeah. You don't have the patience. But if it looks friendly on the eye and, and at a glance friendly, People will read it. So that's just a huge mistake I make is, is not really what they write. A lot of times it is what they write, but just how it looks. Right. You know. Yeah. So the design element is really important. Yeah. And as a copywriter, you have to set that up. So what else sticks out to you when you look back on your career as a successful campaign that uh, you look back and you want to almost emulate? You know, again, I would say there's been, um, you know, I think it's probably different for direct response writers who write consumer campaigns where you have a control because then you get royalties. You know, I haven't done that kind of writing. And I think I think those guys look back at certain campaigns and they go, yeah, you know, I made $50,000 in royalties on that campaign. You know, mine are all, I, I, I hear about great results, but I don't get any financial benefits. I, you know, I get hired again, so I do get a financial benef benefit. I guess so. that's the benefit of, of business to business because they just keep coming out with more things. You like yes, the business to business? More work? Yeah. 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 In business to business, you have a stable of clients and they keep coming to you for more and more work. Author, speakers, coaches, you may only work with an author once. But what I do there is I have strategic partners who have a book publishing company of some kind so that... The, that company is my client, and they funnel a lot of authors to me. I got you. So I right you. now, I have like five strategic clients that funnel a lot of work to me. A lot of author, speakers, coaches yeah. come yeah. to me through these five companies. Then I also work with author, author speaker, coaches to come to me directly. But I'm not constantly looking for different author, speakers, coaches. I find these strategic partners who right. work in right. the universe they funnel the work to me. That's really the way to do it. Yeah. yeah. Is that how you fell into the more spiritual niche? Because, you know, it's so much different from you're talking about so technical medical right, to right. spiritual. It's such a differential there. Well, I've always been a spiritual guy of, you know, really working on my mindset. And, you know, I, you know it, 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 to me, it's this simple. How many times have we all used this, this expression in our lives? Be careful what you wish for. You just might get it. Right. Or X, Y, Z has never happened to me. Knock on wood. You know, what goes around comes around. You know, and the reason we say that is we all believe it. We all believe what we put out there is going to come back to us. And a lot of people go, eh. But nobody would ever walk around their backyard and in a very emotional, heartfelt voice talk out loud about how they want to get in a car wreck and attract cancer and all of that. Nobody would do that. I mean, just me saying that sounds creepy. Right. If you tried to do that, it would completely creep you out. You would physically not be able to do it. Every fiber in your body would say, shut the hell up. You know, because we do, everybody has a belief inside that what, you know, what goes around comes around. What we put out there is going to come back to us some way. Now, you call that the law of attraction or call it whatever you want. But I think everybody really has that deep-seated belief. I think it's a very natural belief. So I've always had that type of belief system, and I always wanted to blend that type of work and writing into my business, but and into my B2B copywriting business, but I didn't have any idea how. Mm -hmm. And just through, ser by putting that out there, that intention, through serendipity, a friend who, who, who uh, does my special, designs my special reports and things like that, works with a lot of authors, and he told me about an author group called Author U here in Denver, uh, Colorado. He said, you should join, you know, and these authors need help. They don't know how to write marketing material. So I joined that group. Mm -hmm. I exhibited at their big event. And not knowing what to expect, I, I invested like 700 bucks in this event. And I met three consultants who had companies. And two of them, actually, all three of them send me a lot of work now. And the three of them, that was kind of the type of books that they handled. Mm. So that 
kind of work started flowing into my business. And it's just one of those things where you set your intention, you put it, you don't know how, when you kind of relax and let it come to you, you don't, you can't think of how this is going to happen, but it happened in a way I never would have expected. So I wanted that to happen in my business. And I kind of gave up and go, I don't know how to make it happen, but I kept wanting to do it. And it, and it, and it happened. And now it's a big part of my business. So I am, I'm very thankful for that. So what should, <laughs> Casey, what should authors know about launching successfully for their book? They need to know that they're going to have to do most of the marketing. You know, that, that's the biggest thing. I, I went to Hay House, had a, uh, a writer's event here in town. A couple of years ago, I went to. And that's one and, of the biggest spiritual publishers. Yeah, it is. Hey, you know, Wayne yeah. Dyer's there and a um, bunch of, you know, people. And uh, Reed Tracy, who's the CEO of Hay House, this is a very business oriented uh, <clears throat> conference. He was up, he was like the main speaker, and he said, okay, if you sign a contract with Hay House, and this would probably be true of most any publishing company, and I'm going to say what he said in general because I don't want to get in trouble for. So in general, what he said was, if you sign with us and you, you turn in a 200-page manuscript, we're going to give you like 40 pages of notes of changes we want you to make. We're going to have control of the book cover design. You know, and we have rights to your book. And you're going to get a royalty, which I think with authors like 7%, something like that. I don't know exactly. But um, it's not real huge. And what he said was how it works is you already have to have a built-in platform. So if we sign you, we want to see that you've got a mail, already got a website about the topic about what you're writing. And we want to see that you've got at least 20,000 followers that you can email to sell your book to. Yeah. Okay. Then when your book comes out, we are going to do... For the first 30 days, we're going to do 10% of the marketing. You're going to do 90%. And after 30 days, you're going to do 100% of the marketing. Now, that might be a little different if you're Wayne Dyer or someone like that. But for your typical author looking to get a break with a publisher, that's how we mapped it out. You've already got to have a platform of yeah. 25,000 people to email about your book. Yeah. We're going to do 10% of the marketing. You're going to do 90 which makes you think, well, why, why not just self-publish? If I exactly, can. yeah. But, 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 the, but the fantasy of they're gonna, you know, a company like that is going to take on my book, right? And I can, they're going to do all the marketing. You can sit back, up, relax, and sit up a book yeah. tour. They're going to have me on Ellen and Oprah and everybody. That's just, that's just a fantasy. That's the equivalent of that in the screenwriting world. Was oh they're gonna buy my script they're gonna pay me to do all the rewrites I'm gonna have a, a director's chair on the set they won't change any lines unless the, unless they come to me like you know like 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 a playwright in the theater you know has total control in a screenwriter world it's they buy your script you've just sold them a piece of property they own it they can do anything they want mm -hmm. they can rewrite the heck out of it with other writers and take your name off of it because it's now theirs you sold it to them right. You know, so that's kind of the equivalent in those two worlds. There's a lot of, a lot of fantasies authors have that someone else is going to market their book. Yeah. So, Casey, tell me what um, campaigns that you worked on didn't do as well as you wanted, or the feedback wasn't great, and why? And we talked a couple things about the <clears throat> adoption, but what all, what other campaigns that you had to tweak that they weren't working as well? You know, I, you know, in the author, speaker, coach world, I really haven't had anywhere. Um, I had to go back and redo the copy. No one ever came to me and said we've determined the problem was the copy. Yeah. You know, pretty much the problem on, on book campaigns is the author doesn't get enough partners. You know, in other words, what I mean by that is if you're putting out a book, and it's based on the broadcasting industry, or you know. Um, blogging or, you know, podcasting, you know, online communication. You want to have a lot of friends and associates in the, in the blogging world, in the podcasting world, who are going to also market your book, okay? And you're going to have a website landing page for that book. And what your friends get out of being able to market your book is that they can have free gifts, as part of your campaign. So when people buy your book, they can download a free gift provided by Casey Demchak. Mm -hmm. But to get my free gift, they have to opt into my list. 
So I'm helping you market your book to my list. Mm -hmm. And then any all the other people who are doing that, everybody funnels into, all the buyers funnel into this one landing page and they get my free gift they have to get on my list. So by helping you market your book, what I get out of it is that I get I build my list. Mm -hmm. You know, so really that, you know, when when campaigns haven't worked, it's because usually the authors didn't have partners. And it's just really hard to sell a lot of books without mm. partners. And then in medical device, like I said, <clears throat> once the initial stuff goes out, you, you just make tweaks based on feedback you get from, you know, the sales force. But I've never had any really yeah. bad ones where somebody said, hey, your copy is the reason. There's just, just too many variables. There's a lot of variables, yeah. There really is, yeah. What know. about just an aha moment in general that you, a light bulb went on and made your copy even better? You know, I, for me, it's every day I'm trying to learn. You know, I, I read, I get, I, I read other mm -hmm. writers' stuff. You know, I went to um, AWI's boot camp. I was a, one of the B2B speakers this year. But by being there, I got to sit down and listen to Bob Bly and, uh, Richard Armstrong and, and Dan Kennedy and John Carlton and some of these people and uh, Herschel Gordon Lewis. Yeah. And I just pick up nuggets from them. You know, yeah. I'm kind of past the beginning stage, but I just listen to um, little things, little nuggets that can help help me tweak. You know, like one of the things I picked up along the way, you know, like I talked about earlier about making making sure your copy is more of a two-way dialogue instead of a one-way monologue. Um, if, you know, like one mistake you'll see is like on a landing page, they get all this information down on the product. And then at the very bottom, it'll say, you know, order by such and such date, get 20% off our normal price and you'll save $400. Okay. Well, there's this thing called sell the special. That could be the biggest thing that sells. So you take, you don't take, just have that. You save four hundred dollars way down at the page. You bring that up to the top, and you sell the special or sell mm -hmm. the offer. Mm -hmm. You know, if there's if there's something where you're going to have a big savings, that's what you sell. You know, it's like when you're writing copy to get people on your newsletter list, and you're going to, you know, by signing up, they're going to get a hundred dollars in free reports and videos. You don't say come to this page to sign up for my email list or to get a bunch of free tips. Sign up for my email. List. You know, I want to give you hundreds of dollars in free gifts, and then you to lead with it instead of putting it like a, a, a really small print yeah. at the bottom. So for me, there's just a lot of subtle stuff that I'm always trying to yeah. learn to detail. Another one uh, several years ago was learning to, especially in the B2B world, it's so much feature benefit of a gadget or something like that. But you always, what I learned was, okay, you want to humanize, you, what's the human value of that benefit? You know, you know, here's the feature, this is what it does, but what does a person get out of that? How does it make their life easier or make their day go quicker or make things easier for them to get done or make them recover quicker or make them feel better about themselves? So try to detail the copy out to where you're having some sort of human benefit, not just a physical benefit. You know, like like with a piece of machinery, it won't break down. This using this type of belt will minimize. You know, the statistics say by using this kind of belt, the machine breaks down thirty percent less often. Which means if you're the night foreman, you know you're going to keep up with your quotas, to keep things on schedule, have a lot less hassles. Try to detail things out to yeah. where you're you're having some sort of human value benefit yeah. mixed in with any kind of physical benefit that a product yeah. offers. So a lot you. You just keep learning and picking up stuff. And then when you get that stuff, you go, oh, why didn't I know that, think of that before? You know, or, you know but you, see, you just keep learning. You, you have to be committed to, it's a cliche, but, you know, ongoing learning. Yeah. You, know, you never think that you know it all because you don't. Yeah, you relate it back to their everyday life so they can relate to it type of thing. Yeah, I, I call it the emotional. You know, we've all heard of the unique selling proposition statement. I go, well, you got to learn the emotional selling proposition statement or a human value benefit statement. And, and a lot of times people go, well, that doesn't apply to B2B. That's business consumer. And that's just not, I don't think that's accurate. Mm -hmm. Casey, since it's Inspired Insider, I always ask, tell me about your lowest moment and then how you, you pushed forward. 
You know, I'd say my lowest moment was a few years ago. My, I, I was really focused on just medical device. And my business was just kind of sliding back. And, and I wasn't, and I realized, well, I'm, I'm not enjoying it as much. You know, I'm still real good at it, but it was just seemed too, there's got to be more. You know, I've been writing for a lot of years. And that's when I thought, God, I, I've got kind of this neato, somewhat spiritual, metaphysical part of my life that it'd be great if I can infuse that into my business. And that was, so that was kind of the low point, but mm. The low point made me look at myself and my business and realize, what do you really want? You know, how do you want this to really go for the next? Because, you know, I'm a writer. My thing is I'm not going to ever retire. I'm going to write till I die, basically, and try to make money at it. So I kind of let go, and that's when I got involved. I told you the story about a friend of mine who told me about this group, and I went and invested $700 and got a $40,000 return on it in one year, you know. I just kind of let go and set my intention. Mm-hmm. You know, it's the old story of if you if you want to go to New York City from where you're at, from Chicago or Denver, but you have to do the drive at night, are you confident you can get there? Of course I can get there. But with your headlights, you can only see 200 feet ahead of you at a time. Right. So you don't need to see 900 feet ahead of you. You just know your destination and maybe you can only see 200 feet ahead of you at one time, but you have some sort of positive faith and belief that the stepping stones will come be revealed to you as you go. And a lot of times it happens in a way you never would have expected. A lot of people can relate to how they met their girlfriend or their wife or their significant other. You know, they wanted to meet somebody and maybe they reached the point where they just go, I give up. I'm looking here, I'm looking right. there, I'm looking to this club, I'm doing that. I just give up. And then what happens two weeks later? In a way, you never, you know, why don't you come to this get together? No, I don't feel like going. And something inside of you says, just go. And you go and you meet somebody who becomes a big part of your life. Mm -hmm. And it happens in a way you wouldn't have expected. There's just something to be said for setting that intention and letting go and not trying to figure out all the particulars, but, but, but knowing that's your destination and let things be revealed to you as you go. And it's amazing how things can work out for you that way. Yeah. And on the flip side of that Casey what's been a proud moment one of the proudest moments well I got a bunch of them man I was I was an all-star baseball player growing up and I won big writing awards in college and what position I was a catcher okay I was a catcher yeah I see some balls behind you actually so that's yeah no I don't know if you can see it but I I think it's out of frame, but my catcher's glove from high school is back there so yeah I used to catch too so you come to Chicago we will we'll play catch yeah, 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 no, I love baseball. I think they need to speed the game up. It used to be a little more fast-paced. You know, now with all the pitching changes and everything, I think they need the batters with their batting gloves and basically doing a little so thing. Did you play in college too? or I started playing in college, and my catching hand just kept swelling up real bad. It was oh. the freakiest thing. But, you know, things happen for a reason. And I, I, when I grew up, I was playing baseball all day and writing at night. And so I, I was... Uh, Starting varsity catcher for three years, went on American Legion traveling teams. Then I went to my local junior college. I'm only five foot eight, so I didn't get a big scholarship or the pros because I was I was always starter. My ba- backups were always big guys, but I had a hose down to second, could call the pitches and direct everything and block, blocking balls in the dirt. So I had to go to junior college, and it's my hands just started swelling up, and I had a, I couldn't catch anymore. Yeah. But yeah. I just when I said, well, now I, I, I was meant to be a writer, not a professional baseball player. Right. right. I just went for it, you know, from there. So baseball is a proud, what else? Baseball, I think, um, I think the, you know, that I, I set my sights on starting my own business and this is year 15 of working in this office, you know, and, and not having to drive to work every day. And, uh, you know, I'm very, I'm very, very, very disciplined, but I enjoy what I do. So I don't call it hard work as much as I call it joyful creation, mm-hmm. you know. So I've been able to do that in, um, I have friends who are richer than me in the corporate world, but are miserable and they'll call me up, you know, and they'll go, dude, how do I do what you do? <laughs> how do I, <laughs> what are you wearing right now? You know, you're just sitting there in your shorts and a t-shirt, aren't you? Yeah, I am. I mean, I'm, so, uh, and so I'm proud of that. I'm proud that when, uh, I can take a tech cat now, you know, when I want, basically, you know, when I live with freedom. 
have the freedom. You know, everybody in the corporate world, you reach that point sometimes at two o'clock where you go, if I could just lay under my desk for 20 minutes, I have so much more energy the rest of the day. But instead, you have to sit there and prop yourself up for three hours. And so I can lay down and take a cat nap and come back. Love it. Energized and ready yeah. to go. Yeah. So who are some of your mentors and, and some of the best advice they've given you? I, you know, I, God, so many people along the way. Um, when I worked uh, as a computer operator, one of my best friends, uncle owned the company. That's how I got to work there. And his name was, uh, his name was John Rosso. And I remember him telling me once at work, I was talking about getting a job. I think I was talking about getting a job as a copywriter. And I go, I don't know, you know, if I, if I have all enough writing samples or if I'm fully qualified. And he just said, Casey, you got to remember, man, whatever the qualifications are, you got them. You know, and then uh, when I was 11, I had this baseball coach, and um, I, I was an easygoing guy. I was a good hitter, but I was an easygoing guy because I'm a writer, you know. And I, I hit a double one day and drove in a couple runs with two outs. It was like a clutch two out double. Slid into second base. Yeah, I get up. I'm pumped up. And when I come back to the dugout, he throws his arm around me and he goes, Casey, you know, you were pretty jacked up after you hit that double. I said, well, yeah, I drove in two runs, two outs, you know. He says, well, here's what I want you to do. When you get in the batter's box, I want you to feel like you've already hit the double and you'll hit more doubles. Hmm. I mean, that's like Tony Robbins stuff, you know. Right. I, think, I think this guy ran a muffler shop or something. And he's like, told me that. And every guy going, yeah. And so I did. It's like I'd still walk up to the batter's box and I'd, and, and I'd just get energized like I've already hit a double. Yeah. You know, and I went on a hitting spree and uh, it got to where I'd walk up to the batter's box and I'd think, why do they even make me bat? They had to just put me out on second base because that's where I'm going. <laughs> so that was huge, you know. Yeah. So I just learned. The mindset. The mindset. It, I think the mind, what I learned is, is from, from people, the stuff I've picked up in bits and pieces from a lot of people is your mindset is the most important thing. Yeah. You know, it, it, it really is. It's like I teach young writers. You can learn how to write all these different marketing materials. You can learn all the marketing tactics you want. But if your mindset is one that is negative, yeah. you're really making things tough for yourself. But if you act as if you've already achieved success, it's much easier to achieve your goals. How would you feel? How would you breathe? How would you carry yourself when you've accomplished X? Yeah. Well, yeah. do that first, and it's going to make it easier to accomplish X. Yeah. That's why, you know, some of the most successful people we met, that guy's so cocky. He's in love with himself. Yeah, and they accomplish everything they want. I mean, you don't want to be a jerk, but, you know, you want to be, you want to like yourself. You know, you want to, you want to be proud of yourself and think of, th we've all beat ourselves up in front of the mirror. How many people stand in front of the mirror talking for a minute a day about something they like about themselves? Not they much. don't do it. No. Not much. But how much time do people spend beating the hell out of themselves? Quite a bit. Yeah. So, you know, I think st I've picked I've learned stuff like that from spiritual mentors. I've learned from business people and just little little nuggets of stuff from just tons of people. Yeah. And it could be it could be from reading a Wayne Dyer book, Tony Robbins. It could be the guy running the muffler shop when I was yeah. 11. It's just it's just amazing if you listen to things you can pick up from famous people and um, just anyone, anyone. Yeah, Casey. It's I re like they were, yeah, it's almost like they were there to tell you that. Yeah. So, are you reading anything interesting now, or what are some of your favorite books? I read a, a lot of spiritual books. I also read financial books. I'm reading a really cool book right now by Tony Robbins called Money Master the Game. Yeah, yeah. And it and it's just a really good book. It's different than other financial books. It's in and my audible queue right now. It's in my audible it, queue, yeah. Yeah, it's a real eye-opener. If you haven't listened to it, you'll really enjoy it. So I read a lot of uh, inspirational stuff, I read copywriting stuff, you know. So I kind of scat around. It takes me a while to get through a book because I'm hard for me just to read one thing. Yeah, yeah. So, Casey, I appreciate it. I want you to tell people where can they find out more, where, they sh where should we point people towards? You can find out more about me at CaseyDemchak.com, and Demchak is D-E-M-C-H-A-K. But to make it real easy, if you're listening to this, CaseyCopy.com. If you go C-A-S-E-Y, Casey, copy, C-O-P-Y, 
kccopy.com, that'll just flip over and redirect you to kcdemcheck.com. Nice. So that's really that's the easiest way to find me is just type in kccopy.com, and um, that'll take you there to my uh, to my website. You can find out a lot about me. I put out free information every week. You can sign up for, and uh, you can find me on YouTube, Twitter, Casey. I've got I got the Casey Demcheck on every platform. So. It's kind of cool. I didn't have to. And, and there, I found one other Casey Demchak. It was a gal, actually. Huh. And she got married. Her name became Casey Demchak Bear. And um, now you've been uh, I, so I got many a, years. I, I, yeah, I reached out on her on Facebook. And she goes, are you the dude who got the domain name? <laughs> 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 so I got it everywhere. Casey, my last question is um, I want you to talk about, just for a second, about the book. Uh, you've, you have two books. The Inside Secrets. What should someone know about The Inside Secrets? Yeah, I've got two books. on. I've got a book called Essential Sales Writing Secrets, which is about, oh God, nine years old now. But I've got two e-books on Amazon. One's mm -hmm. called Inside Secrets. One is called uh, How to Develop Key Message Copy Platforms. That's not the exact title, but the book's yeah. about how to develop, which is a product copywriting product I invented. And um, Inside Secrets has a lot of good copywriting fundamentals, which is a lot of the stuff you've heard me talk about today is mm -hmm. covered in depth in that book. Um, key message copy platform, that is a product, a copywriting product I created and it's the basis of a program I'm doing for AWAI right now. And uh, a key message copy platform essentially is a core central document, usually 10 to 15 pages, that has all the essential marketing messages about a particular product or service. Once you get that dialed in, you use that as a springboard for then writing your website copy sales letters, lead gen brochures, all, all your uh, print and digital marketing pieces. By working from a key message copy platform, your messaging is going to be very consistent and persistent mm -hmm. across your marketing channels. And that's essential because repetition builds reputation. You know, So a lot of, a lot of times people, they, write every, they kind of make up their marketing messaging as they go every time they write a new piece. And that's not how you want to do it. So the, that particular ebook gets into that copywriting product and tells you exactly how to write key message copy platforms nice casey it's been an absolute pleasure thank you so much and we'll play catch next time we see each other definitely jeremy i really appreciate it uh, having me on the show and uh love talking to you yeah thank you thank you